Good morning, KW Colorado. Russ Nolting, your regional director here. I'm in beautiful and sunny Durango, Colorado today. Thanks to Kelly, Jenny, and Leslie for helping put together uh, put today's meeting together. Here's our agenda. We've got some quick announcements, some announcements about upcoming events. We're gonna recognize our top performers for April. We're gonna do a quick market update. And then we've got MAPS executive coach, Liz Landry, who also runs KW Talent. She's coming on to talk about listings and uh, acquiring talent. Let's start with some announcements. Um, screen to work for me. Okay. Wednesday of this week, nine to noon at the PPA, PPA event center, we've got four critical listing skills with Peter Shabri. We're going to be doing four panels that day. We're going to have um, lead sources for 2024 that are working. We're going to move to Mofers. We're going to move to listing presentations that crush and then happy seller, happy realtor, four panels uh, featuring top producers from KW Colorado. We're excited about this. Uh, we are sold out, but we opened up some more seats. So you might end up sitting along the wall and uh, come anyway. That is um, registered using KW Colorado events or by scanning this QR code. On June 12th, the region is hosting the Peak Performer Summit in Colorado Springs at the Colorado Springs Marriott. The Peak Performer Summit is uh, going to include a session on um, uh, business boost, uh, how to energize and track the business for 2024. We're gonna be doing a lead gen strategies session. We're gonna talk about how to get your buyers um, uh, paying you top dollar by providing them tremendous value. We're going to explore um, realtors who have ventured into other businesses on an opportunities panel. Special guest is uh, Rachel Adams Lee. Where's Rachel coming from? California from California. She has a tremendous social media following, and she's going to be sharing a nine-step social media model that helped her become an influencer in our industry. Uh, you might look her up on Facebook and Instagram, uh, Rachel Adams Lee. She's sharing her nine-step social media model. Education followed by a networking lunch. This event is $79. It's one hour south of the Denver metro area and conveniently located in the heart of Colorado Springs. See you there. Also, a virtual event um, provided by KW Maps Coaching. Know exactly what to say to win now. Critical conversations in real estate with Phil Jones. Uh, this is 249. It's an all day virtual event on June 24th or June 27th. If you are a KW Maps Mastery client, you can um, get a discount of 100 bucks. You can scan the QR code or um, go to events.kw.com to register for that. Wendy Papazan's coming to Colorado, to the Denver area, to the South Metro Denver Realtor Association to teach the Leverage Series. She's teaching on the 23rd of July from nine to five and then the 24th from nine to noon. This day and a half event will help you identify holes in your business, find candidates to fill those holes, hire the right people and get them trained and excited to work with you long-term. Also, um, last event, I think, uh, September 25th through 27th, we have the Rocky Mountain Summit. Registration is open for this. You can go to kwcoloradoevents.com to register or scan the QR code. We're excited about this. John Maxwell's our keynote. He's going to be uh, hosting a VIP breakfast, which you can sign up for on Friday. He's going to do his keynote address Friday morning. And in addition to that, Ken Posick, 
a famous YouTuber from the Orlando area is going to be talking about how to win more clients and become a local area expert using YouTube. James Shaw is going to be talking about a book that he's just written, right? It's not published yet, but he's going to be talking about it. You're getting an advance notice on it. Um, Brandy Lobker is going to be a part of our uh, luxury panel. Abe Shreve is going to be talking about mindset. Brady Sandal is going to be running Wednesday's Luxury Summit. Awesome event. Get yourself signed up for it. Hotel rooms will sell out soon. So if you want to take advantage of the reduced rate, we've got the height reduced from about 500 a night to 259 a night. Kelly has all the answers over my left shoulder. That's why I keep looking at her. Sign up now. Um, and the calendar in front of you has uh, additional upcoming events that we'll be doing that aren't open for registration yet. Business Planning Clinic with Gene Rivers, ALC Clinic um, in Denver with James Shaw, lots of things going on. Leslie. Hi, everyone. So as you know, I hold our regional tech classes every Thursday at 11 a.m. This month, I'm really focusing on value squared and really learning how to implement your value inside command. Last week, we discussed how to really put together your value proposition. So if you miss that class, make sure you go watch it prior to taking this next class because it'll all make sense. It flows together. Um, next slide. And then you can find us at the on the YouTube channel, uh, KW Colorado Region 7, and all of my classes are in the playlist section. So you can go to playlist and find my classes under there, as well as other classes. And then I have a couple updates for you, some really exciting updates, actually. Um, one is that the property uh, details landing page templates literally just went live about 10 minutes prior to this call. So I was able to sneak this slide in for you guys. I really wanted you to get this update. It's a super awesome update. Um, just like our legacy sites, we do now have that option to create a single landing property page. I like them because they're a little bit prettier this time. And there are some other things that you can do that we weren't able to do last time, such as hiding neighborhood boundaries, if that's something that you prefer. Um, there are some other options like adding um, a title or hiding other fields. So go check it out. Go get started. It's found underneath your consumer applet. And if you're on a team that uh, your website will be found in the Rainmaker uh, property, excuse me, marketing, marketing um, page. Okay. Uh, Yep. And then I had one more slide in there. I'm not sure where it went. There it is. <laughs> I was like, I, I know I had one more slide. Um, this is a really cool update for teams, you guys. We have multiple assignees now being able to receive multiple tasks, which is super cool. You can create a task with up to 15 assignees. Um, option one, any assignee can complete or option two, all assignees must complete. As you can see on the right-hand side here, the modals will give you the prompt to add whoever you need for that agent to be assigned to that task. And it's also available on the go with the KW Command app. So go in and check it out if you're on a team. I know a lot of admins really lean on the task manager and I love this update. So those are the two updates for tech this week, you guys. Thanks, Russ. All right, thank you. So let's move into recognition of our top individuals for April 2024. For closed units, at number five, Brandon from KW Clients Choice with 5.7 units. Lauren from De uh, Denver Central with four units. Uh, Jackie Stratton and Jennifer Hart with seven units each are tied for third. Lorraine Glotch from Pueblo, 7.5 units. And Faith Young, 2023's top units individual led the way in April as well with 15 closings. Moving on to, vo uh, to volume, Stacy Strayer is number 10, Jennifer Hart, number nine, Matt Lee, number eight, Nadia, number seven, the Golesh team, number six, Scott Kurlander, number five, 
Marcia, uh, Marsha McCorkle, number four, and the top three, Jackie Stratton from DTC, Lauren Valono from Denver Central, and Brooke Ganyan from Vail led the way in closed volume. For GCI, Matt Lee, number 10, Jenny Hart, number nine, Nadia, number eight, Rhonda Hagelin, number seven, number six was Scott Kurlander, number five was Jackie Stratton, she broke the 100K mark. Number four, the Golesh team. And the top three, Marsha McCorkle, Brooke Ganyan, Lauren Valono. Congratulations, top individuals, GCI. Moving on to teams. Teams are two people in production. With five units closed, we have a one, two, three, four, five, six-way tie. The Cantera team, Portico Group, Rage Real Estate, Lifestyle Properties, the Vincent Group, and Hoffman Group. Congrats all. Number four, the elite team from Pueblo. And the top three are the Artisan Group from downtown Colorado Springs. Uh, team Rochelle Cozzolino. It, look like, it looks like that's a tie. Number one is High Cap Homes from Denver downtown. Congrats all. Moving to volume, next level properties is number 10, the Vincent Group, number nine, Team Rochelle Cozzolino, number eight, Rage Real Estate from the Highlands, number seven, number six, Lifestyle Properties from Denver Downtown, the Morocco Team is number five from Denver North, Seed Property Group, number four, and our top three closed volume teams, the Artisan Group, number three, the Cantera Team, number two, and High Cap Homes, number one, congrats all. Finally, GCI for teams. The JK Team LLC is number 10. The Collective, number nine. The Vincent Group, number eight. Lifestyle Properties is number seven. Number six is Seed Property Group. Number five, Rage Real Estate. Number four, Harberts and Sons Homes from Partners. And our top three for GCI teams, the Cantera Team, number three the Morocco team, number two, and High Cap Homes, number one. Congrats, top teams. Finally, groups. Starting with closed units, the Atha team from Grand Junction was number 10, the Tiffany Home team, number nine, the Awaka group, number eight. Number seven was a three-way tie between the PCS Pro team, Kibler group, and Colorado Lifestyle Real Estate group from DTC. Number six, was a three-way tie between the Towner Group, Homes of Colorado Group, and the Dixon Group. The Lucha Group was number five, Elite Home Partners number four, and our top three for closed units, Jamie Baker Orr number three, the Johnson Team number two, and the Empower Home Team, Colorado Front Range, Denver Tech Center number one with 21 units. Great job all. Moving to volume, Place 87 Alliance Team came in number 10, the Thompson Group number nine, the Towner Group, number eight. Rocky Mountain Home Team, number seven. Homes of Colorado Group was number six. The Dixon Group, number five. The Johnson Team, number four. And our top three for closed volume, EHP, number three. The Luchik Group, number two. And number one, Empower Home Team, Colorado Front Range, Denver Tech Center. Congrats, Gay and team. For GCI. The Thompson team came, uh, the Thompson group rather, came in number 10. The Trinity team, real estate, came in number nine. Number eight is the Rocky Mountain home team from Vail. Number seven, Homes of Colorado group. Number six, the Towner group. Number five, the Johnson team. Number four, the Dixon group. And our top three GCI elite home partners with $275,378, the Luchik Group with $289,823, and GCI number one spot goes to Empower Home Team, $368,372. Congrats, top groups. Expansion reports did not come out for the month of April. So as soon as those come out, we will honor our expansion teams. For volume market centers, Client's Choice was 40, uh, number five with 42 million and change. Denver West, number four with 46 million. Partners in Colorado Springs, 66 million. Downtown, Denver, 90 million. And DTC, 109 million. Great job. Closed units, Pueblo with 99, Grand Junction with 100. Partners with 158. 
downtown Denver with 182 and DTC with 185. And listings taken. Number five with 74 units, Denver West Tide, KW Client's Choice. Downtown, 117 listings taken. Top three, Pueblo, 119. Partners, 122. DTC, 135. Great job. I'm turning it over to Cato for a market update. Cato, are you here? I am. Give me one second here. All right, can we see my slides? Yes. All right. Hope everybody had a great weekend. Uh, it's been a pretty exciting couple of months in finance going forward, but uh, let's take a look. So uh, looking at uh, CPI. So it's gone down to 3.5. The problem with that is it is trending in the right direction. Uh, way. However, we'll talk about unemployment later on. That's not going up to the level we need it. The Fed really needs us to get down to a 2.0%. I've had a couple people ask me, well, you know, everybody's saying the new floor is around three. Why don't we just make it three? What you have to understand is that the Fed, uh, the uh, federal banks from all over the world have agreed to the 2%. So the U.S. can't just decide to do one way when everyone else in the world is another way it causes too many problems with the banking however we are starting to see it come down a bit with it being an election year we do expect it to be a little more volatile again colorado is kind of following the same trend as we're seeing across the country but overall uh we're seeing our inflation go down a little faster than most the rest of the country but ours also heated up a little faster as well so we're really just kind of catching up to the market right now. Now, why that's important is, and this one is on core PCE, which is very similar to CPI, but the closer we get to not getting down quickly enough, the harder it is for us to get back to that 2%. So what the Fed needs to do right now is cool down our economy as much as possible. That will cause some issues moving forward with real estate from the consumer's point of view. As brokers, this will actually increase how you're gonna make money in the market because we will see more volatility, we'll see more deals show up. So this will be a good thing for you as long as you are still working on your sphere. Um, unemployment rate has gone up to 3.9% from 3.8 the previous month. We really need it to be up at right around 6% to make it make sense to show that our economy is slowing down. Part of what we're gonna see with that is with the number of people crossing our borders, we're getting a lot more people and they're putting a lot more stress on our economy without any new work being created. So we do expect to see that number come up. However, it's going a little more slowly than the Fed would like to see than most economists would like to see as well. Savings rate. Uh, savings rate dropped again in March. This is critical for us in real estate in that we've dropped almost a full percentage point since January. In January, we were at 4.1% savings rate, meaning if someone earns $100 at the end of the month, all they're putting in is $4.10. Well, now we're down to $3.20. As you all know, if people aren't putting money aside for their down payments, for fix up on homes, things like that. It makes it harder for them to sell. Uh, we still have huge amounts of equity in homes. I just talked with two lenders last week at a, a, a conference I was at, or I'm sorry, a, a class I was at, where they both talked about that they're seeing an uptick in HELOCs from people because they're trying to consolidate credit cards or trying to work on their house before they sell it. So we are seeing that type of thing. Credit card usage hit another all-time high last month. So that is becoming a little worrisome for the banks as well as for the lenders. Now, I threw in, usually I have a little shorter area in here to talk about mortgage applications. However, I decided to throw in an entire year so you could get a perspective of this. The blue lines that are in the positive territory show where it was up. And obviously the beige lines heading down shows where it was down. So you can see that 
while we look a lot better over the last six months than we did the previous six months, we're still not running gangbusters like we should be in the third week in May. So that is something that everybody is paying attention to. And this is a national trend. But what I want to bring your attention to below is you can see what it looks like from a perspective for the 30-year fixed mortgage and applications. Just to kind of give you an idea, people are still being somewhat price sensitive. Now, top agents who are out there working it, they're making a killing. They're getting a lot of deals done. People are starting to get used to these rates being the way they are. I'm going to tell you right now, my prediction is this is going to be the lost decade of rates. And what I mean by that is these rates are not going to come down significantly for the next 10 years based off of the debt load that our country is carrying and what we need to do for our 10-year treasury. So with that being said, really start talking to your people about this is just where we're at and we're going to move forward and give them some sense of security there. We're not actually in a bad place. Because if you look in April, rates were at 7.85. They've come down to 7.7. 7, uh, I'm sorry, 7.575. So they are dropping some. They're stabilizing. They're not changing that much. And if we look at the mortgage rates over the last 40 years or so, we see that 7.74 was the average. So please understand these super low rates we had over the last eight to 10 years were not typical. And people have made a huge amount of money. They bought homes. They sold homes. They've done all kinds of things over the last 40 years at the rates that we're at right now. So this is something your buyers do not need to be afraid of. Treasury spreads are still extremely high. Uh, they did not have the Q1 numbers out yet. I've been told it actually raised to about 3.13%. Uh, I haven't seen the actual data on that, that was just something that I heard from another economist who said he had personally crunched the numbers. So we'll take a look and see where that comes. We should have that by next month for you. Uh, the affordability index, we are still extremely affordable. Colorado is affordable based on where we are sitting through this. So again, get your buyers out there, get them looking. We've got plenty of inventory out there now and it is growing. So we're sitting in a great spot right now. If we look at the K-Shiller, we can see that we're above the 0% line. So we're appreciating pretty well again. Uh, in April, the Federal Reserve saw no changes in the dot plot, which I found to be very interesting because Chairman Powell came out and basically started getting us all ready for the fact that there very likely won't be any cuts this year. And you're gonna hear them go back and forth in the news because they've got to keep Wall Street happy they're trying to keep the incumbents happy. They're trying not to set everybody off. And we have all these bonds for corporations that are recasting this year. So a lot of these companies are very price sensitive right now. So that being said, we don't at this point expect any price cuts this year. There is still a possibility there could be one in November. I guess we'll wait and see on that. But if our economy doesn't cool down, it's going to be impossible for them to cut rates and not cause major issues. Now, that being said, what's wonderful about this is you can see that our pricing is still rising. We have inventory starting to rise. We have pricing starting to rise. Our days on market are going down. We have an extremely strong summer selling season. So make sure that you're getting out there with clients. Make sure you're doing the showings. Uh, everyone I know who's been doing open houses the last month or so have said they've had record numbers in there. So take the time to go take a look at that. Uh, you'll see that months of inventory were up to 1.87 months. At six months, we're considered a balanced market. So we are still a very strong seller's market. Denver Metro probably won't stop being a seller's market for at least another three and a half to four years minimum unless there are some drastic, drastic changes in the economy. So overall, we are looking very strong there. Our median close price crossed the $600,000 line for the first time uh, in April. One of the things I want you to take a look at is if you look at the chart on the left, you're gonna see that listings are going back up, but we're basically going back up to where we were right before the pandemic. So we're in a great place there. And then I also want you to see on the chart on the right that pricing is still going up. 
So we're doing exceptionally well with we're getting inventory back on the market. Pricing is higher. So while it's a little harder for the buyers, sellers are doing exceptionally well. And we're just seeing that it's going to shift our days on market, but things are getting sold. Uh, average income in Colorado right now to afford an average home is $116,100 per year. If you actually look, we're actually below that in Colorado right now. We need our income to catch up with our housing. That will cause us to have some pricing corrections over the next year or so. Right now, we're not seeing that at the moment, so it will come eventually, but we'll take a look at that. Uh, inventory growth is right in, seeing in Colorado. We're at 31, per, excuse me, 31.5% year over year. So that is good as well. Buyers have a little more choice. That will also put a little bit of negative pressure on our pricing as we move forward. Overall, our market view, again, I did like I did last month. I put in the previous months versus this month, just so you have them side by side to compare them. Uh, really, you're going to see that all the numbers, for the most part, are going up. We are seeing the market get very healthy very quickly. It looks like May, June, and July are going to set up to be excellent, excellent months for us when it comes to selling properties. It looks like we will start to slow down in mid to late Q3, uh, just based on the trending. But uh, Kelly's got a copy of this. She can get a copy to everybody. Our market overview is looking exceptionally strong in the Denver market area. It looks like we're going to keep the number one pace for a little while. Again, home sales, we're expecting them to slow down a bit. Uh, if you remember, I said I thought we'd be closer to the 4.1 million annual. I think uh, Gary is more correct that we'll be at the 4.3. We may even exceed that a little bit this year from what we're seeing nationally. At least in Colorado, we're going to overshoot it, and that's a great thing for us. You know, our purpose as realtors is just to get the deals closed, to help our clients and do whatever we can for them. So we're going to give you some suggestions here, folks. Make sure you're calling your sphere at least three times more than you expect to, and calm them down. A lot of people are freaking out. We're, our market looks so much better than it did three months ago. A lot of times the consumers are behind they don't know exactly what's going on. So it's your job to educate them and get this in front of them on a regular basis. This, uh, please sign up for the four critical listing skills class. Uh, I've been talking with Peter. It's going to be an absolutely magnificent class. Make sure you're going on three or more listing appointments every week. The people who are out there who are working, they are doing amazing uh, right now, they're just selling things left and right. The realtors who are waiting for their phone to ring, they're not doing so well with it. Also, open houses are doing excellent. Memorial Day weekend will be a great time to do open houses. So if you don't have one, talk to the listing agents in your market center, see what you can set up with them. Obviously, make sure you're reading and learning every day. And then really start putting as much money aside as you can because we're going to have one of the best investment markets, one of the best transfers of wealth that you'll ever have in your lifetime coming up over the next three years. So you really want to be part of that. Russ, back to you. All right. Thanks, Cato. Appreciate it. Well, I'm super excited that uh, I'm going to let Cato stop sharing. Yeah. Sorry, switch screens on me here. All right. I'm really excited that Liz Landry is here today. Um, Liz is an absolute expert coach. Uh, she coaches some of the top teams in our company and uh, from all over the place. And uh, Liz, what do we need to know about listings? Well, hello. Uh, did I see some familiar names and faces on uh, Zoom? It's been a long time since I've been in Colorado to speak. And, you know, virtual is what we'll do today since that's what we've got here. Um, you know, actually, I, I have a question for Cato on there because I was going through the data for Colorado as uh, as you were going through Cato and I couldn't see it on my screen. It was too small. What are you guys on sales, actual closed units year over year this year against last year? Did I could I see that correctly? Was that down 15 percent or was that April that was down 15 percent? Uh, April was down 15. Let me pull it back up real quick. So uh 
Sales volume, we were up 5.46%. Close, we were up 1.66%. Uh, in March, we were 13.4% up. Okay, so units are, units in terms of closings are up. For Correct. You guys. Okay, good to know. Um, so let's talk about listings. The reason I asked that is because that's very pertinent data. So first things first is when we are looking at listings, we have to understand the market because here's what, you can start this entire conversation with. Data doesn't lie at all. It doesn't. And you know what people can't argue with? Data. Because data is not somebody's opinion. Data is fact. And when we look at listings, it's best to talk in fact, not in opinion. And frequently, we'll have conversations with people that think we're simply sharing our opinion. So go ahead and jot that one down as we enter this conversation. Data doesn't lie. And um, second thing I want you to jot down on your piece of paper, write down really big at the top of your sheet, simplify. Write down simplify. Why am I having you write down the word simplify when it comes to listings? Well, as markets shift and things change, which I would argue that you guys have seen some significant change in the last five years, right? Denver has been one of the booming hottest cities in the country for years. And you're starting to feel this cool off effect. Looking at 31% year over year inventory increase while you're still only at 1.8 months, that means that listings were going on and probably selling within hours, if not within days at the very latest. Now we're likely starting to see some inventory increase. And while it's only 1.8 months, that's still technically a seller's market, like well into a seller's market, it feels really slow. And so what happens when we start seeing that is we tend to feel creativity creep in. We want to do new shiny things. And this idea that we heard on stage or this crazy thing that somebody came on to the Zoom named Liz and said that one of her coaching clients was doing. I want you guys to avoid all the fluff as we have this conversation. And I want you to keep going back to simplify. When in doubt, creating the more simple plan, not doing less, but doing things more simply is typically going to get you further ahead in shifting markets. And the reason why is we can get lost in the creativity of certain things that are not proven tactics because we like them, they sound good, or they're fun, or they worked for that one person that we heard. So as Russ said, I'm a MAPS coach. I coach a lot of large teams. Um, I've been a MAPS coach for 14 years. This will be my 14th year. I have had a lot of conversations about listings. Prior to becoming a MAPS coach, I was a real estate agent just like everybody else, right? That's how everyone in this company gets their start. We have all knocked doors. We have all made prospecting calls. We have all gone through it. I happened to decide to do that in 2006 in the state of Florida, which if you've looked at that historical data that Cato shared earlier, not a great time to get into real estate in the state of Florida. It was rough. The next four years were very tumultuous. And here's the thing about it. Nobody wanted listings. Nobody. Those of us that were taking listings were taking market share and were able to build big businesses. So as your market shifts, don't get caught up in ideas that are not proven. Stick to the simple ideas and go with simplicity. Simplicity proves with listings. So why do I bring up that I've been a coach for 14 years and I've talked to a lot of people? Well, I get to have conversations about markets every single day. And I think it's important for you guys to get some perspective as well on top of the data that Cato shared about what's kind of happening out there nationally. You'll have conversations with people that live in the Northeast right now that are still receiving 37 offers on listings. They've got three days worth of inventory and they're going 20%, 30% over asking all day long. Northeast on fire still. You'll have conversations with people out of Texas on the flip side who are going to say, 
I've got 23 listings sitting on the market. I've got another 20 coming back behind there. We are at the highest inventory we've seen in 15 years. And I can't sell a listing to save my life. They're costing me money. We have very dynamic changes going on in the market. So while national statistics are important, the most important thing is your local statistics in your MLS or in your major metropolitan area. Again, the data doesn't lie. So here's one of the first things that I'm gonna encourage you all to do that you're going to use on your next listing appointment. You are going to track some specific data. Your market center may already track this. If they don't, you can start tracking it. It's super easy. First recommendation, start this one. Every Monday morning, you're gonna pull a few numbers. Your first number is going to be the total active inventory, either in your MLS or your major metro area. It's up to you based on how big your MLS is. The second data that you're gonna pull is how many listings came on live in the last week. The third, how many went pending in the last week. And the fourth is how many closed in the last week. If you are so inclined and you like data, you may also track active days on the market. You may also track active price points sold, and you may also track number of price reductions and cancels or expires. The first four are the most important. The reason why is that three weeks worth of data shows a trend. Three weeks worth of data going in any given direction is a trend. Data doesn't lie. And in order to take listings in what is going to prove to be a harder market as it shifts, because shifting markets are the most difficult, the data can do a lot of heavy lifting for you. So remember that data doesn't lie, track your data. All right, so now you're gonna get your piece of paper back out. Next thing I want you to do is to draw a good triangle on it. Nice big triangle. At the bottom, I bet you all can put in there what you know this is gonna be. It's gonna say leads. On the left-hand side of that triangle, it's going to say listings. And on the right-hand side of that triangle, it's going to say leverage. Next to leverage, draw three little offshoot lines on leverage. There are three different types of leverage, and this is important as markets shift. The first type of leverage is processes and systems. The second type of leverage is technology, and the third type of leverage is people leverage. I'm going through that triangle and I'm pointing out those three different types of leverage to you because this is really crucial when you are having either uncertain dollars in income, we are having uncertain predictability in the market, or we are in a growth mode. Our first natural instinct is to hire people. Leads, listings, leverage. I'm busy. I'm doing all I can do. I've got to get a person. The first place you actually look is your systems and your processes. Then it's where can I get cheap technology that can be a leverage piece for me? And then it's what's the body that I'm missing the relationship to take this to the next level. Okay, so when you go through these things, it's leads, listings, and then the leverage piece. So if you are finding yourself at a point where you're, you're tapped, you can't do any more, find the most crucial aspect and look at first your processes and systems around it, then look at your technology around it, and then look at your people around it. So using that aspect, let's talk about the bottom of the, the triangle, your leads. Listings always start with the right amount of leads. So how do we get more leads? Well, the natural inclination is to say, well, I need more leads. I need to do more work. And there's a lot of people that will give you that method. And it may be necessary. Um, I was speaking with one of my coaching clients, this top agent in the Northeast in the New Jersey area last week. And she said, our market is down 40% on sales. 40% in units. My response to that was, so what do we have to do to fix it? What do we have to do to still meet your goals? And she said, well, I have to do 40% more activities. That's the natural reaction. I've got to do 40% more activities. And then I said, okay, well, what else do we need to do? She said, well, I've got to get 40% more training in too, because I likely need to change my conversations. I was like, great. Tell me how much lead generation you're already doing. She said, well, I'm doing 15 to 20 hours a week. Okay, and 40% more would be how much? She said, well, I'd, I'd be up to nearly 30 hours a week. Okay, that's a lot, especially if we're really trying to keep to that 40 or 50 hour work week. How much education are you doing already on a week? 
She said, well, eight to 10 hours. I said, okay, and 40% more will be how much? She said, well, I probably up to 14, 15 hours a week. So now plus the lead gen, education and lead gen, we're at a 40, 45 hour a week. Where do we service the clients? And we run into this rock in a hard place because this is what a lot of you are likely feeling. I don't know where else I can fit more time in to do more things. I'm so busy with all of these other things like running my business, servicing my clients, hosting the open houses. How do I get more in to get more leads so that I can get more listings? Look at our three leverage points. Your processes and your systems is your first leverage. What is the process and the system by which we are doing our lead generation? And anytime we're doing lead generation, it starts with who, not what. Who are we actually lead generating to? So if you are looking for listings, what are some things we might consider? And you guys can just put them in the chat for me and I'll list some off as well. What are some factors that we may look at to say, this is somebody that's likely primed for a listing. I, I have more chance of getting a listing from this type of person who fits X criteria than I do that type of person who fits Y criteria. What type of people... What could it be? Is it location? Is it price point? Is it demographic? Is it somebody who lives in certain neighborhoods? Is it geographic? Who's likely to want to list their house? Expireds, perfect example. Relocation, absolutely. Fizbos, literally already raising their hands. Once we run through those, which are, by the way, your highest and best, you will run out that's when it starts getting harder. So now who do I look at? Well, my sphere of influence. They're the people that already know me, like me, trust me, and be willing to do business with me. So if I can talk to them and one of them is thinking about selling, it's most likely I could get that listing. Got it. Well, now what? Think about why people sell. Everybody has to put their head somewhere to sleep at the end of the day. Everybody. They're either in a rental doing that or they're in a home that they own doing that. Who owns rentals? Investors, right? So everybody's always buying and selling. There's plenty of transactions taking place. 4.3 million, as Cato said earlier. You guys, your market is up year over year on units. This is a great thing. So think about the efficiencies on the who we're calling. We can start with the easies, the expires, the FISBOs, sphere of influence, the relos. Those are all really prime candidates. The other people that are going to be likely to buy, and this is just shooting some ideas or likely to sell, this shooting ideas out there, um, probate if you are into that type of business. People getting divorces if you are into that type of business, which by the way, I hated doing those. So I'm not, it's not so much that I'm recommending that as is a very viable and good lead generation source. It's up to you if you want to do that type of business. Other ones that are likely to sell, First-time homebuyer communities have a significantly higher turnover rate than your higher price point move-up buyer communities. They turn over at nearly two to three times the rate that a move-up home turns over. Because who buys first-time homebuyer homes? First-time homebuyers. If we look at the demographic of first-time homebuyers and just the statistical data, they are at an age range where they are likely to be moving into their highest income earning years in the very near future, which means they're going to be able to spend more money and want a bigger home. They're also likely to be at that phase where they may be growing a family. Growing families need more space. So whether that family is dogs, cats, pigs, llamas, or children, it is irrelevant. They are likely to be wanting to have more space. Look at the turnover rates of your communities. Who is actually moving? Because while I love community XYZ, if community XYZ is only turning over at 2%, it's probably not in my benefit to farm and to prospect community XYZ when I only have so many hours in the day. I need to go to where the turnover is. Georgia Alpazar is my regional director. She has been my regional director for nearly 20 years. And probably my second or third year in the business. And it was, by the way, 2008, my second year in the business. The financial markets were crashing. Things had come to a screeching halt. Average days on market in Florida was like 12 months. It was painful. 
And I said, Georgia, I said, I, I need, I need more listings. Like I got to keep this business moving. And we were on this week to week basis, right? Everything it was listings were sitting so long. And she said, best advice I ever received, which was also the best advice I've ever received. I got from her. She said, go where money is changing hands and get in the middle. So where is money changing hands in your area so that your lead systems and processes can be the most efficient? So you are talking to the most amount of people possible that have a possibility of selling. This is where it's simplify. Don't make a more complex plan to try to pull people apart from their home to get them to sell. Simplify by going to where people are already going to sell and then get between them and the transaction. You don't need to create the transaction. You need to get between them and the transaction. You are the conduit that will help fill their goal. What's their goal? Likely to sell their house and move into a bigger one. Go where money is changing hands and get in the middle. Every area has pocket neighborhoods that are popular, school districts that are popular, streets that are popular. There are reasons people move into certain areas. Find where money is changing hands. It is never even across the board. So once we find where money is changing hands and we put ourselves into the middle, step two is the next part of that triangle. Listings. You're at a listing appointment. Now it's a matter of skill. There's no luck. You've already gotten to the table. If you get to the table, it's yours to lose. How do you lose it? Not having the right skill set. If we get to the table and we don't have the right things to say and the right data to back us up, the person sitting across the table who we're probably asking to part with money that they have mentally committed as theirs at this point is going, well, that's just Liz's opinion that that's what my house is worth. That's just Liz's opinion it'll take that long. That's just Liz's opinion that I need to do these things to sell this listing. No, if I've got data, because data doesn't lie, that's the market telling us this is what it takes to accomplish your goal. I am the facilitator to help you accomplish that goal. This takes the pressure off of you as the real estate agent being the bad guy, and it puts it on you being the professional that's helping them accomplish their goal. Russ shared earlier um, some dates that Phil Jones is doing a training, I think June 24th and 27th for, for MAPS Coaching and full day event. I've paid a lot more than $250 to spend a day with Phil Jones and I would pay it again. He is an absolute master of words and conversations. And the things that you will learn in that session will by far be the best return on investment you could spend that day. I bring that up to say, I want you all to go listen to the very first episode of the MREA podcast. Very first one, Jason Abrams did it with Phil Jones. And they talk about how to diffuse all the pain points of working with a buyer or seller and how to get over all of those objections. And he makes really hard conversations sound incredibly what? What was our keyword? Simple. He takes all the emotion out of them, takes all the pain out of them, and he makes them simply factual because data doesn't lie. Now, to be able to learn how to have those conversations, that is an art, that is a lot of practice. That is upping that education 40%, right? It's, it's choosing where to put that in at the best, highest and best use for you. But if we start going where money is changing hands to get in the middle, we get to the table and we're able to get the listings because we're having the right conversations, you get your next third stage of problems. The third stage of problems is my favorite stage of problems, leverage. Now you have so much business and so much going on and you're doing so well. And now you need to find talented people. Nobody gets to the third stage of that problem without mastering the first two. It just doesn't happen. Listings, even in 2008 and 2009, arguably the worst real estate markets in the state of Florida has ever seen, far worse than the 80s, listings still won the game. They will win the game this shift too. And here's the thing that we need to be aware of. It's not going to soften up and it's not going to get easier for us until 2026. 
If you look at those data curves that Cato showed earlier on those economic trends of units, we're going to ride this for two to three years before we start seeing significant increases in unit turn. And in the meantime, more homes will come on the market because people still want to accomplish their goal of getting their next house, getting little Johnny in that school district, getting a divorce, unloading the property that they shouldn't have bought because it was a bad decision in the first place. Whatever it might be, they have a goal that is to sell that property. Question is, are we going to be the person who puts the sign in the yard and helps them accomplish that goal? We're doing the right lead generation where money's getting exchanging hands and getting in the middle. We're having the right conversations at the listing table. We now have good problems to have, which are leverage problems because we are so busy we need help. That's how you win the listing game. And remember, look at those three leverage pieces, systems and processes, technology and people at every step of the way. How do we get the most efficient way of doing something? And how do we use technology to one-up it? And then how do we actually bring in the people? Any questions on any of that? No, I was just that, it was that great. I know it is. Uh, here's the thing I, I will also throw in there for you guys. Um, Again, when I started in real estate, I was brand new when I joined Keller Williams in 2006. My anniversary, my 18 year anniversary is actually coming up in two weeks with Keller Williams. And I fought every single thing they told me. I fought the MREA, I fought my OP, Gene Rivers, I fought my regional director that there had to be a way to win this game that was not in that magical red book. And I broke down and I followed the magical red book and then miraculously it all got easier, right? It was like, oh, it's actually working now. But I was trying to complicate things. Do not try to complicate your world, simplify. When in doubt, ask yourself, is this, am I complicating this or am I simplifying this problem? Because simple solutions are things that you will actually implement. Complex ones are just distractions from keeping you from doing the work that you actually need to do to accomplish the goal. Simplify. Uh, Anita asked, where do we find the MREA podcast? Oh, looks like that Kelly put it in there. It's also on any um, streaming platform that you might use. I listen to and subscribe to it on Spotify. It's on the Keller Williams Facebook page constantly. You can find it directly at millionaireagentpodcast.com. It's on iTunes. It's anywhere you might go. Liz, Travis has a question here. How do you balance the simplicity concept with the shiny things that sellers like agents to implement? Use data to back up your conversations and get really good at what you know the conversation needs to be. Uh, truthfully, because when you can, sellers want us to do, hey, can you stand out on the road and spin this board to my open house? While I can, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, what we know is that statistically less than 1% of homes actually sell from the traffic that comes into the open house. And if I was to take that same amount of time calling local real estate agents where cooperative brokerage happens, right, where someone brings the buyer to the home, to talk about your property and why it's a great purchase for the people who work that area, I'm highly more likely to secure you a buyer for that property at that point in time. Now, that doesn't have to be the spin you take on it. But what they wanna see is they think something works that's the shiny thing. Well, we want you to advertise this on Zillow. Okay, let's pull the data and talk about how many homes actually sell directly from that and how many sell from the other avenues that we're actually going to invest our time, marketing, and energy in. Data doesn't lie. When it comes out of our mouth, even if it's data, by the way, they still think it's an opinion. Documented, printed data doesn't lie. It's really hard to argue with. It's no longer your opinion when it's documented, printed data. I love that. Darcy, you had your hand up for a moment. Yeah, I actually had the exact same question. Just how do you stay on course? Because, you, you know, your natural brain is like, no, I got to do something different. So just kind of the same thing. Just yeah. how do you stick to the boring? Stay <laughs> I, I got told years ago by a mentor, um, and Gary had said this to this mentor that I have, and they said, I was bored. 
I was like, I, I'm, I'm queen shiny thing. I love shiny things. I find them so fascinating. Who doesn't, right? And it's like, oh, well, somebody on stage said this worked for them. So I'm going to try it for me. And it's a great distraction that makes me feel productive while I'm not actually accomplishing the end game goal, which is get more listings, get more leads so that I can hire more leverage to build the business I want. Like, I get it. We all fall victim. And remember this statement, there is great boredom in mastery. When you get bored, go deeper. It means you simply need to get better at that. And if you think you have mastered it and you think that you are the absolute best at it, I promise you that's because you're sitting in the wrong room. We will never catch the people who are actually the best at it. The best we can hope to do is keep pace with them and keep going, following them and learning from them. We will never actually always be the best. We follow the best because people have been here longer. They have done it more, right? There's great boredom and mastery. So if we're saying I'm holding, hosting open houses, I can't get the traffic I need. Revisit the shift book and look at a seventh level open house. Am I doing everything I can be doing to go deeper into making the open house effective? Am I going deeper into my lead generation to make the things that I'm doing more effective so that it's not just double the amount of time you're calling, maybe we can call the same amount of time, but just shift to who am I calling and what am I saying? I love that. Liz, we really appreciate you being here today and sharing your uh, coaching and talent with us. Absolutely. Absolutely love it. Thank you so much. Uh, one final announcement to make. Uh, don't miss next week's, excuse me, next month's regional rally. We've got brand builders coming. And if you were at the CEO summit with Gary Keller uh, at Family Reunion, you saw the uh, brand builders CEO, Rory Vaden speak. And he and next month, we've got people from brand builders coming to talk about how you can create your own personal brand so that you can truly hone in on your audience so that you can find your next listing. Don't miss that. Thank you all for being here. See you soon.